God, the love of God, and the coming again of Jesus Christ, and the end of the age. Not the end of the world. There's not going to be an end of the world. But there is going to be an end to the age in which we live that's dominated by the devil and dominated by evil. That will come to an end. And Christ the Messiah is going to come back. We want to talk about that a little bit today. The second chapter of 2 Peter. Now, 2 Peter in your Bibles comes right after 1 Peter, if you're having trouble finding it. Beginning with verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those who would live ungodly in the future. And deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and trials. If you're going through a serious temptation now or trial now, God knows how to deliver you. If you'll turn to him and pray by faith and believe and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Those that are outside of Christ, those that live wicked lives are being reserved until the day of judgment. There is a judgment day coming. The biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah comes down to us today as an example of what could happen even in this decade or in the decades ahead if we don't turn to God. Now Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities and they were at the place that now the Dead Sea is in the Middle East. The Dead Sea is 10 miles by 50 mile inland lake in the Lord Jordan Valley. It's a mineral-saturated body of water which is 1,260 feet below sea level. It's the lowest part of the world. In Genesis 13, we read about Abraham. And Abraham is going through that part of the world with all of his flocks and all of his family, going to the land that God had promised him. He was a man of God. And he had his nephew with him by the name of Lot. And he saw that the servants of Lot and his servants were not getting along too well. So he said to Lot, Lot, let's divide. We've gotten too big. There are too many of us. Too many cattle. Your cattle and my cattle are getting mixed up. You choose wherever you want to live. If you want to go west toward what is now Palestine, or if you want to go across the Jordan and go to the Jordan Valley, which is lush like a Garden of Eden, you take a choice and I'll take the other way. So Lot looked all around and he looked down toward Sodom. He looked down toward Gomorrah and he saw that that was a very wealthy part of the world, a very wonderful part to live in. He consulted his wife. She said, by all means, we want to go to Sodom. She wanted to go where the good times were. And so Lot told Abraham, all right, Uncle Abraham, we're going to go. We've chosen to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and go down to the lush valley of the Jordan. And we'll take our cattle and our servants and our people and our family, and that's where we'll go. Abraham agreed, said, all right. The Dead Sea was surrounded in that time. It was no Dead Sea, of course. But at that time, it was a lush, unbelievably lush part of the world. But with their wealth came a lifestyle of hedonism, sexual obsession, and perversion, the like of which has hardly ever been equaled in the history of the world. So that today, the word Sodom is used 
to describe a certain lifestyle that people may adopt. As God has sent a flood to destroy a corrupted humanity in Noah's day, so upon Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent a totally destroying judgment of fire. And that fire of brimstone that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah not only destroyed it, but sank that part of the world to the lowest part of the earth. Now, what were the sins of Sodom? Why did God allow that judgment to fall? The first sin that they had was false security. They were secure. And we today have a security behind our oceans and behind our military power. President Yeltsin has stated that the whole world could be standing unknowingly on the edge of an abyss. And you saw in your papers this morning the problems they're having in Russia right now, in the government. We have a false security. Woe to them that go down to Egypt. Now, Egypt in that day did not have much to do with Israeli people. And yet, time after time, the Israelis would go down to Egypt for help. And he said, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots. But they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. Isaiah the prophet is speaking in the 31st chapter when he says that. They had false security. They thought they were absolutely secure. Nobody could ever take Sodom and Gomorrah. Then their second sin that the scripture mentions is pleasure. They lived for pleasure. In Job 20, the fifth chapter, it says, The joy-making of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but a moment. You only have a moment to enjoy it. Then you have eternity to regret it. The scripture says there are pleasures in sin for a moment. Then it's all over. And then there's nothing but the remorse and the guilt. The scripture says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the scripture says, the heart is sorrowful and the end of mirth is heaviness. Even when you're laughing, many people. In Psalm 53, 1, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. But if you go back to the original language in Hebrew, here's what it says. The fool hath said in his heart, no to God. He's not saying there's no God. He's just saying no to God. You see, you can't prove scientifically that there is a God, and you can't prove scientifically there's no God. But everybody knows there must be a God. And then there's another sin that Sodom and Gomorrah committed. It was overindulgence. The majority of the world, a great part of the world, lives under what we call the poverty level. And in Luke 21 it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day comes upon you unaware. John Eastwood wrote some time ago, People do not decide to be drunkards or drunk addicts or prostitutes or murderers of, or thieves, but they pitch their tent towards Sodom and the powers of evil overcome them. And how many of us are like that? We pitch our tent towards Sodom. We sort of live half in Sodom and half with Abraham. We sort of enjoy Sodom. We long for the things that Sodom has. We'd like to have the fun and the pleasure we imagine that they're having. We'd like to have all that money. But the powers of evil will overcome you. And you will die before your time and be lost from God. In Jude, the 12th verse, it says, there are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. 
how many times we see charitable events and we thank God for those that are sincerely interested, but they go to have a big time and to be seen. And there's a spot in their charity. And that's the spot. And then the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had some new strange gods. Whenever a man seeks or honors or exalts anything more than God, that's idolatry. And there are many of us that are guilty of idolatry, but we don't realize it. In Psalm 44, it says, If we've forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hand to a strange God, shall not God search this out? Romans 1, it says, We've changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. We worship our bodies and we worship our good times and we spend more on our cosmetics than we do worshiping God and Christ. That's modern humanism. And then they were also guilty of greed. Greed was a plague on the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the addictions that today has thousands of Americans in its vice is gambling. And part of the gambling motivation is greed. Workers throughout the industrialized world are becoming increasingly traumatized by overwork and their effort to earn more than their needs require. So we neglect our families to get more money so that we can, and we don't really need it. God has promised to supply all of our needs, but he's never promised to supply all of our greeds. And then, in the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, so bad that God gave them up. In Romans 1, it says that God just gave them up three times. He said he gave them up. Has God given you up? No, the very fact you're here today shows that God has not given you up. God is still speaking to you. There's still a chance for you to come to Christ. There's still an opportunity for you to receive the love of God and the gift of God in Christ. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy. And anyone who believes in high morality today is laughed at. Jeremiah said that they had forgotten how to blush. And there's a lot of truth in that. Now, God warned Sodom. He sent some angels to Abraham to tell Abraham what he was going to do. He was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And Abraham said, wait a minute, Lord. If I would find some real believers in Sodom, if I found 50 righteous men, would you spare it? And God said, yes. He couldn't find 50. So he said to the Lord, all right, Lord, what about if I found 40? And after a while, he said, 30, then 20. Finally, he said, if I find 10, Lord, would you spare them? And God said, yes, if you find 10 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare Sodom. But he couldn't find them. And that is a lesson to us, the importance of a dedicated minority. A minority of people who believe and who live it. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, says Isaiah 1, 9. To you Christians, Jesus gave a warning. He said, remember Lot's wife? The angels told you not to look back. If you did look back, you'd be turned to a pillar of salt. Well, she did look back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. That's an example for us today. Remember Lot's wife, one of the shortest verses in all the Bible. Don't look back. 
Many of us look longingly at the world, and many are like Demas, having forsaken Christ because of the love of this present world. Now, the climax of history is going to be judgment. The Bible warns that the world is in for a gigantic judgment. The only bright spot is the promised return of Jesus Christ, because the Scripture teaches from one end to the other that Christ is going to come back someday. He's going to set up his kingdom, and evil and the devil are going to be eliminated, and this is going to be heaven on earth when Jesus comes back. You see, Jesus Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross and died for us. He took all the hell and all the judgment on him at the cross. And the scripture says, God so loved the world, God so loved this present world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that includes you, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, well, when is Christ going to come back? Jesus said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We don't know the day. Don't, don't speculate. It's coming. It's sure. He left us certain signs. I wish we had time to go into all of them today. I believe that every one of those signs is being fulfilled right now. And Christ could come back at any time. For How will Christ come? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a glorious time that's going to be when Christ returns. The voice of the archangel. I'm looking forward to hearing that voice. I've never heard an archangel. And the trump of God. What trump that'll, trumpets that'll be? Now it'll also be a time of personal judgment when you if you've really never received Christ, now you may be baptized and you may be confirmed and you may be a church member and all of that. That's wonderful. I'm thankful. But that's not enough. Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, all your religion is not enough. You must be born again. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you open your heart and surrender to him as Lord and Master and Savior, at that moment, your name is written in the book of life. And if my name were not written in that book of life, you'd never get me out of this stadium until I'd made sure it's been written there. Because only those who are written in the book of life are going to enter the kingdom of God. You see, for those who are written in the book of life, Jesus Christ died on the cross. They put nails in his hands and a spike through his side and a crown of thorns on his brow. And he suffered one of the most agonizing physical deaths that a person can suffer. But that wasn't his real suffering. The real suffering of Jesus Christ was when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, God took your sins and my sin and laid on Christ. He bore our sins. He went to hell for us. He took the judgment for us. So the cross is a judgment. What do you have to do? Repent of your sins. And you're not sure that you've repented. To surrender totally to Christ. Your heart, your mind, your body, your life. So that Christ is first in your life. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen thousands of people do this past week. Get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. And you can get up and go back and join your friends. We're going to give you some literature, a book that will help you in your Christian life. But you get up and come. And don't delay. Because he says, now is the accepted time. Today is the 
day of salvation. You may never have another moment like this as long as you live. When will you ever see another thing like this in Pittsburgh? Maybe another generation or maybe never. And as far as you're concerned, it may never be. We're going to wait for you. You come from way up there, wherever you are, God is speaking to you. And back here, where the seats have filled in, you come and join them. Just as hundreds of people have responded to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, so can you right where you are. Just call the phone number on your screen right now. Special friends want to help you with this important decision, so don't wait. Please call now. You that have been watching by television here in this great Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, where three rivers come together right here, you have heard the message and God has spoken to you and we've seen hundreds of people come here, many more hundreds on the way. You can make your commitment to Christ where you are. You can say yes to Christ. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you and give you a new life. Let him come into your heart right now. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I do repent of my sins as best I know how. I'm not sure that I know how, but Lord, help me to repent and help me to believe, Lord. I need your help even in the believing and help me to follow you and serve you. He'll help you. If you make that commitment, call that number on the screen. Now we're going to wait for others that are still coming down the aisles. There's still time for you to make that important decision. Take a moment right now to call the number on your screen. Someone will pray with you and talk with you about your spiritual condition and the hope and forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. Call right now. This concludes our spring television series. We're so glad you joined us. Just before we leave you for this time, we want to remind you to pray for Billy Graham and the team as we prepare for special meetings in Cleveland, Ohio, and Atlanta, Georgia in the days ahead.
Now for Billy Graham and the entire team, this is Cliff Barrow saying goodbye and may God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free. So come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today, I want you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. I suppose more than any other book in the Bible, this book predicts the future, unless it's the book of Revelation. And when you read the book of Revelation, always read the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel in one hand, the book of Revelation in the other, and then in front of you, the daily newspaper, and they all tie in, because Daniel is a book of prophecy. But the thing that I want to talk about Daniel today is an incident that happened in his life that I think bears on what we see happening today in our world. And in this chapter that we're turning to, I won't take time to read it to you, I'll tell it to you. It's the story of Daniel already in Babylon. He had been carried to Babylon from Jerusalem. Jerusalem had come under the judgment of God as Jeremiah had predicted. All the judgments that Jeremiah predicted, all the judgments that the prophets predicted have all come true or they're yet to come true. This is God's word. It is an infallible word. And in many places in the scripture, the Bible predicts that future day of judgment and that future period of judgment that is to come upon the world. Well, Jerusalem had been judged as Jeremiah had predicted. He said, unless Jerusalem repent of their sins, they will be judged. And judgment came. And among those that were carried captive away by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon, 1,500 miles away, was young Daniel and his friends. They were just in their teens. And they were carried over to Babylon. And Daniel had been one of the young men that had been chosen especially by Nebuchadnezzar to be taken to Babylon and trained in his court and trained in all the arts and sciences of the Babylonians. Now, when this chapter opens, Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Daniel had been a friend and a prophet and a prime minister for Nebuchadnezzar, the great king. But now he's in more or less been forgotten because a young man is now on the throne by the name of Belshazzar, who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, the great king. Now, Babylon at that time was the greatest empire in the world. It was the most powerful nation in the world. It was the richest nation in the world. 
And the Bible pictures Belshazzar the king as young, rich, powerful, but at the same time egotistical, self-centered. And the Bible teaches that God hates pride. And Jesus was to say years later in Matthew 23, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. If you try to tell how great you are and leave God out, or if you act as though you can solve your own problems and arrange your own life without the help of God, God says, I'm going to bring you down. And then he was a man that was very carefree. He was a playboy. He loved ease and he loved pleasure. And the Bible says, woe to them that are at ease. We in America are at ease in comparison to the rest of the world. And so Belshazzar had just won some military victories. And his father, who was a great general, was out on the frontiers leading them from victory to victory. And so he decided that he wanted to celebrate. And he decided to have a great feast. And it would be the greatest feast that Babylon had ever seen. Babylon with all of its glamour. Babylon with all of its wealth. Babylon with all that it had. He said, we'll have the greatest feast in the history of the world. So he ordered the finest dances, the finest wines, the best foods, and he sent an invitation to a thousand of his lords and ladies throughout the empire to come. And in their jewel chariots, they came. And that evening, as they were feasting and dancing and whining in the low-hanging gardens that Nebuchadnezzar had built for his Midian wife, one of the seven wonders of the world, Belshazzar became intoxicated. There he was, king of an empire, master of a banquet, the center of all attention, dancing the night away. But the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Belshazzar, watch out. Judgment is coming. You're going too far. There's a point beyond which the patience of God will not go. There's a line drawn among nations and among individuals and in families and in communities. Job said, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Keep on plowing your iniquity. Keep on sowing your wickedness. You're going to someday reap it. Hosea said, for they have sown to the wind and they shall reap a whirlwind. Jeremiah said, they've sown wheat, but they shall reap thorns. And so in the middle of this banquet, Belshazzar's dancing with a beautiful, sexy young girl. And all of a sudden, everyone is quiet. You can hear a pin drop. His face turns white. The Bible says he begins to tremble. Because over on the wall, an armless hand starts writing. And everyone sat there trembling, wondering what this was, what strange thing this was. And Belshazzar tried to read it. He couldn't read the message. So he said, let's call the astrologers and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans. Let's call the magicians. Let's call all the people that can read this type of thing. And they came in. They couldn't read it. Belshazzar was even more afraid. The writing was getting lighter all the time and more brilliant. People were frightened. And his mother heard about it. And his mother, incidentally, was not at the party. But she came in and she said, son, what is this I hear about a strange writing? And he pointed over to the wall. She said, I know a man that can read that writing. His name is Daniel. He's a great prophet. He helped your grandfather interpret dreams. He was prime minister under your grandfather. He's been living in sort of semi-retirement. Perhaps you don't know him. Daniel was not at the party. But they sent for him. And he came in, and Belshazzar said, Daniel, you see that writing? If you'll read that writing, I'll make you the third ruler in the empire. 
I'll put a gold chain of authority around your neck and I'll put royal robes on you and you'll be a member of the royal family. Next to me. Daniel looked at the writing and he recognized it immediately. That was his father's handwriting. That was God the Father's handwriting and he had studied God and lived with God all these years and he knew that that was God's writing. He said, Belshazzar, I can read the writing, but keep your gifts. I don't want them. Give your gifts to somebody else. You see, Belshazzar, O king, you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of God's holy house before thee, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine in them, and God is offended. And thou hast praised the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and stone that see not and hear not and know not. And the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways thou hast not glorified. Yes, Belshazzar, I'll read it. God had given Belshazzar everything he had, even the ability to laugh. His food, his drink. His power, his riches, everything had come from God, but he hadn't thanked the Lord for it. Daniel said, all right, here's the writing. Mini, Mini, Tekel, you parson. This is the interpretation. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Belshazzar, you're finished. Your last day has been spent on this earth. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances of God and found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And while they were in the banquet unknown, unknown to the Babylonians, the great Euphrates River was being changed in its course and the Medo-Persian army slipped under on the dry riverbed. And that night, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar was killed. Daniel remained and became prime minister in the next empire. Both empires respected him for his wisdom and his faith and his purpose and his godliness. Is God writing on the wall of America tonight? The word many also re means remembered. God remembers. God remembers our sin. God sees our pornography. He sees our obscene films, and he sees these new films that are coming out making fun of Jesus Christ. He sees our lying and our cheating and our corruption that goes all the way through our society. He sees it all. And the scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. But he remembers something else too. It's not too late. God remembers to forget. When any group of people, any nation, will repent of their sins and turn to the Lord, he'll forgive their sins and heal the land. That's the promise of the Lord. Secondly, he says, thou art weighed in the balances and found one. The scripture says, thou dost weigh the paths of the just. The Lord says, by the Lord actions are weighed. All the ways of a man are clear in his own eyes but the Lord weigheth the Spirit. The nation, the world tonight is being weighed. You are being weighed in the balances of God. Our sins are great in the eyes of the Lord. And we are being weighed in his balances. And many thinking leaders believe that the handwriting is already on the wall and the judgment is already beginning to take place. But God weighs us as individuals. What's he going to weigh us by? What's on the other side of the scales? You see, here's the scale. Here's you, and here's what God weighs you by. First, he'll weigh you by the Ten Commandments. 
how do you stand up with the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not murder. All of these are taken in the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says if we offend in one point, we are guilty of all. If you've broken one commandment one time in your life, it's the same as breaking all of them. Well, you say, well, of course I've broken at least one or two of them. Well, then you're guilty of all. And that's the reason the Bible says we're all guilty. That's the reason Jesus said, you that are without sin, pick up the first stone and throw it at this woman taken in adultery. None of these religious leaders could do it because we all have sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and all are under the judgment of God. Then not only are we going to be weighed by the Ten Commandments, but we're going to be weighed by the law of love. Matthew 22, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, said Jesus, hang all the law and all the teaching of the prophets. It's all summed up in love. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? And do you love your neighbor now, your neighbor means anybody that's in need. Jesus taught that in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Anyone who's in need, you love that neighbor as much as you love yourself. That's what Jesus said. We're going to be weighed by that law. Thirdly, we're going to be weighed by the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Psalm 89, For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Isaiah said, To whom will be likened me and make me evil or equal and compare me that they should be like me? God says, Be ye holy, for so I am holy. If you don't, now Jesus Christ was the only righteous and the only holy man that ever lived. We call some people in India holy men. But Jesus was the only truly holy man of history. And if we don't live like Jesus and live as good as Jesus is, then we come short of God's requirement and God's expectation. Will you say, Billy, who in the world can live like Jesus? Nobody. That's the reason you all have to say, I'm a sinner. God is going to weigh us by Christ. He's going to weigh us by the Ten Commandments. He's going to weigh us by the law of love but he's also going to weigh you by your works. Those sins of omission that you weren't even conscious of. In Matthew 25, Jesus reminds us, for I was a hungered and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you never came and visited me. But the people will say, Lord, where, we, where did we see you naked and sick and in prison and thirsty? Then he answered them this way. Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Now that strikes every person in this arena. And we come short. And then Jesus pronounced judgment. He said, those that are guilty of the sin of omission and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. You say, well, Billy, I'm sort of devastated. How can any of us weigh up? We can't. Jesus said in Revelation 3, I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. So then because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, he said. 
Listen, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to miss heaven that you think are going to be there. And then, fifthly, he's going to weigh us by our opportunities. By our opportunities. To whom much is given, much shall be required, he said. Think of living in America with all of its advantages. A church on almost every corner, a Bible in almost every hotel room, millions of Bibles available, the gospel by radio and television. Think of living here. He's going to judge us by the opportunities we had. Think of the Christian literature that's available at bookstores. And we don't take advantage of it. To whom much is given, much is required. You say, well, Billy, even on that score, I, <laughs> I can't make it. No. But the glory of this whole thing is that there is a gospel. And the gospel is good news to people like you who are sitting there saying, well, I'm guilty. The good news is that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross to die for you. And God took those sins of yours and those failures of yours and laid them on Christ. He became sin for us. Now he said, the just and the righteous are going to get to heaven. How am I going to get a justness and a righteousness of my own when I don't have any? I'm a sinner. I don't weigh enough to get to heaven. But on the cross, Christ provided a justness for me. He provided a righteousness for me that I didn't have. And I am acceptable tonight by God, not because I've been good or because I've read the Bible or because I've preached to crowds of people. I'm acceptable because of Christ. I'm accepted into the beloved because of him. And that's your privilege at this moment. You can appropriate what Christ did on the cross to you right now, and you can leave here weighing enough to get to heaven, weighing enough to have your sins forgiven, weighing enough to live a new life. Thou art weighed in the balances of God and found warning. Are you found warning? The last word here is you parson, divided. Thy kingdom is divided. God said, Belshazzar, I'm taking your kingdom away from you. You're finished. Judgment has come. It's too late. Is God going to say that to you? Judgment has come. It's too late. I know people that know that and accept that and believe that and just go on merrily dancing their way to hell. They're like the mouse that's been caught in the trap that's still nibbling at the cheese after being caught. You're still nibbling at the devil's bait. And you're already dead as far as eternity is concerned. I believe this crusade has been held at the right time and in the providence of God at the right moment in the history of many of your lives. People have prayed for you. People have worked. People have given to make this possible. And now this is your moment with God to receive him into your heart, to make sure that you weigh enough. No, I won't be at the judgment. There is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus. I won't see you there. The judgment that I deserved was taken by Jesus Christ at the cross. And I accepted what he did, even though it looked foolish and looked a little bit ridiculous, for me to come forward that night and say yes to Jesus Christ in front of all those people, I did it. And I'm going to ask you in just a moment to get up out of your seat and come forward and stand in front of this platform and say, by coming, I want Christ in my heart. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. 
But don't you let this afternoon pass until you've said yes to Jesus Christ. Because you see, you may never have another moment like this. This may be the last moment that you'll ever have. And now is the moment. You get up and come. With hundreds of people that have come this past week, even thousands, you come and join them and say today, I want Christ to forgive my sin. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to weigh enough when I have to be weighed in the great scales of God at the great judgment. If you come from that top gallery up there, it'll take you a couple minutes to come, so come right now, quickly, from everywhere. Hundreds of you. God is speaking to you. You may be in the choir. You may be an usher. Whoever you are, you get up and come. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. As you can see on television, hundreds of people are coming here in St. Louis to make their commitment to Jesus Christ. They want to be sure that their sins are forgiven. They want to know that they weigh enough in the scales of God. No, I don't believe it's too late for America to turn to God. I believe we could have healing in our country. I believe we could turn to God and find a whole new atmosphere if we did turn to it. But that can also happen in your life as an individual, and it can happen in your home, and it ha can happen in your block, and in your community, in your apartment, in wherever you are. But it must start with somebody. It could start with you, if you will say yes to Jesus Christ right now. I hope you make that commitment. God help you to make it. And be sure and go to a church next Sunday. Good evening, and God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a supernatural... Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library.